Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. It is a great pleasure and joy to have as my guest tonight one of the most acclaimed and successful directors in motion pictures, Mr. Robert Wise. His four Academy Awards attest to the artistic respect he has earned and the tremendous grosses on such films as The Sound of Music, West Side Story, and The Andromeda Strain attest to the overwhelming popularity of his works. Now, after five years, The Sound of Music is being reissued nationally. Tonight, Mr. Wise will talk about The Sound of Music and some of his other films. This evening, Robert Wise on Cinema Showcase. Thank you very much, Mr. Wise, for talking with us. It's a pleasure. Jim, pleasure to be here. Thank you. This marks the first reissue of The Sound of Music after five years. During its initial release, it, of course, became the all-time top money-making champion. What are the expectations this time? Well, they're uh, guardedly quite high. Uh, nobody knows on a reissue how it's going to uh, relate to the initial one, but uh, we did open here in New York, in the New York area, just last weekend on Friday. And we had a smashing weekend that I believe, according to reports, are, is a little ahead of the initial issue of the film. So mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're hoping that's a good sign. Wonderful. And, uh, we're looking forward to good grosses. Do you expect to reach new audiences this time or pick up the same? Uh... Partially, uh, both. Of course, we, we feel there are many, many uh, youngsters who were really quite too small to see it five or six years ago who will now be, just be kind of marvelously ripe and receptive audiences, and yet uh, in addition to that, we feel that there will be many, many people who saw it before. As a matter of fact, I've had many people that I've run into who, on hearing it's going to be reissued again, are saying, I must see it again. I'm most anxious to see it. So I think we'll get both new audiences and repeats of uh, the older audience. Fox has gone all out on this reissue of The Sound of Music, and I know you're, you're much impressed by this. Yes, I am, because so many times reissues come out and they rather dig the prints out and put them out. This time, uh, Fox is going all out. They're giving it a fine, fine exploitation campaign. They are getting brand new 70 millimeter prints for the initial engagements and new 35s for the subsequent uh, broad general release. They're sending uh, five of the seven children around to various, uh, I think, 40 or 50 cities to promote it. And uh, they're uh, going all out on the ads. They've done new TV trailers. In other words, they're going out and giving an absolutely top drawer uh, issue this time so that people are coming to see it uh, need to have no qualms that they're going to see a, f a fine print and a f top drawer performance of the film. Right, because you're reaching a whole new audience this yes, time. Yes, a whole new audience, we hope. Well, I'm certainly one of those who will go back to see it many, many more times. Has your opinion altered as to why it was such an overwhelming success? Not really. I've asked, I was asked that many times uh, when it came out, and I think uh, it was a combination of things, all the, the factors of the material itself, the marvelous score that Rodgers and Hammerstein did, Julie in the part, and the cast we got together, the, the uh, uh, contribution that shooting on the actual locations in Salzburg and Austria gave us, which came off magnificently. And then one other factor that uh, none of us could anticipate that I think was, was very strong, and that was the the fact that at the time we came out, there was a real hunger for this kind of entertainment all around the world, not just in this country. And I think mm -hmm. that is something that was an unknown uh, uh, quantity, but I'm sure it contributed very much to the success of the film. In talking with Richard Rogers, he said, of course, it's often accused of being too sentimental, and he said he has to defend that, but he does that gladly. And uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with sentiment. I'm on sentiment. I'm certainly for it. Uh, uh, are you? Yes, very much. We were conscious of this when we did the film, and as a matter of fact, uh, we, we tried to diminish some of what we felt was the excessive sentimentality uh, in, the, in, in the original piece on the stage. But we couldn't, of course, get right to the heart of it, or we want to get to the heart of the whole thing, which is the basic story and quality itself. And sure. if it's sentiment that appeals and attracts us, many of millions of people around the world, I'm all for it. Well, the film musical was certainly no stranger to you uh, after having won two Oscars for West Side Story. But how did Sound of Music come about for you? Actually, uh, a bit by accident. Uh, I had done uh, West Side and a couple of other things, and I had come to 20th Century Fox in 1963 really to uh, prepare and organize another film that I was going to do. Was that Sand Pebbles? The Sand Pebbles, yes. 
Uh, but it was a very big, uh, challenging, uh, difficult film to get together. Where to shoot it? It was a story about China. We couldn't go to China, of course, and it became apparent it was going. To it was going to take forever to sort out all the, the difficulties of getting that one on the screen. And in the meantime, uh, they had uh, uh, The Sound of Music and uh, were interested, because of West Side Story, in the possibility of my directing it. And uh, so they simply said to me, would you be interested, while you're getting organized on the Sand Pebbles, to consider doing this one? So I read the script, listened to the score, uh, and that was it. We signed a deal, and I went into it. How long was the film in production? Uh, we shot for actually six months. I was uh, I, I uh, was in preparation, that is, finding locations, organizing, casting, rehearsing the musical numbers with the choreographers and all, about four or five months, shot for six months, and was another uh, four or five months on post-production. So I personally spent almost a year and a half on it. Uh -huh. Well, of all the great stage musicals uh, that have been filmed, Sound of Music is certainly the most visual. In other words, when one is watching it, you're never... You never really feel you're watching a film stage play. Did you follow any particular method in opening it up? Well, the obvious thing would be, since it is a story about, about Austria and that locale, it was to go with it. This is what mm -hmm. films could do is against the stage. So immediately, it uh, automatically opened up tremendous possibilities. But it's not just enough to be able to go to places and shoot. You have to, and particularly with musicals, you have to think of and design how you're going to put the musical form which is not as uh, simpatico to the screen as it is to the stage on film, how you're going to treat that foreground against those backgrounds. So once given the possibility of opening up, the, best, the, 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 the greater part of our energy from there on was put to how can we so stage it and so select our locations and so marry the two mediums that they will be compatible and right together. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is simply what our, what our look and our challenge and our feeling was all the way through mm -hmm. organizing this. Well, here is a perfect example of what you were just talking about, and we get to see some of the beautiful Austrian location in a portion of the Dore Me sequence. So, from the Robert Wise film, 20th Century Fox release, here is part of Dore Me from The Sound of Music. Do, a deer, a female deer, Ray, a drop of golden sun, Me, a name, I call myself far, a long, long way to run. <laughs> so, a needle pulling thread, la, a note to follow. So, <laughs> tea, a drink with jam and bread, that will bring us back to dough. Oh, 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 go! A dear, a female dear, Ray, a drop of golden sun. A name I call myself Far A long, long way to run So A needle pulling thread La A note to follow so Tea A drink with jam and bread That will bring us back to dough A dear, a female dear Ray A drop of golden sun Me A name I call myself a long, long way to run. So, a needle pulling thread. La, a note to follow. So, tea, a drink of jam and bread. That will bring us back to do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, so, do. Beautiful sequence from The Sound of Music. We're going to take a look at another favorite. In fact, it's one of my favorites in the entire film, My Favorite Things. So, Julie Andrews and the children singing My Favorite Things. Daffodils, green meadows, skies full of stars, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Green-colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with a moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. 
<laughs> Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, <laughs> snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white winters that melt into springs. These are a few of my favorite things. When the dog bites, when the bee stings, when I'm feeling sad, <laughs> simply remember my favorite <laughs> things, and then I don't feel so bad. Does it really work? Of course it does. You try it. What things do you like? Pussy willow. Christmas. <laughs> Bunny rabbit. Yes. Hey! Oh, <laughs> no school. He'll oh. fight. Oh. Telegram. <laughs> Whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Oh, cream colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with a moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. Oh, together. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white oh, winters that melt into fine. spring. These are a few of my favorite things. When the dog bites, bug bites. Really beautiful sequences. Can you watch clips such as those and do so in a detached way, or does it always bring back? Oh no, it memories. always brings back memories. Uh, my favorite things, for instance, I recall very vividly as being the very first thing we shot on the film. Really? That was the first sequence we shot. We had rehearsed it very well, of course, ha beforehand, but mm -hmm. that was my first days of directing Julie and the children at the studio. And then the other one, of course, uh, 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 Do Re Mi, makes me think always of how we had to, because it all had to be rehearsed and pre-scored in Los Angeles and Hollywood before mm -hmm. we went abroad. So we had to carefully work it and lay it out to photographs and locations, and then it always reminds me of how we pieced it together once we got over there and how we made it all come together. Atmosphere is, I know, very important to you, and you certainly caught a great deal of the atmosphere in Austria. How important is this for you? Well, I think terribly important in, in, in any film, no matter what. It's not the whole thing. The foreground and what you're telling with the people, of course, is paramount. But if you surround them with the right and properly used background in, the, in relation to the story you're telling, I think it just heightens the whole uh, pull and involvement that the audience can have with the film. Now, perhaps you can use The Sound of Music as a reference to this, but uh, having seen all of your films since Blood on the Moon, with the exception of one, I've been able to observe in all of them a sort of lyrical realism coupled with an optimism that marks really your directorial style more than anything. In other words, no matter what the subject matter, you handle it realistically, but you do so in a very poetic, lyrical manner. Now, does this make sense, or did I just make that up? I've, that's what I've observed. I suppose. I don't know, Jim, whether I've really thought, thought it through to that degree. I do know that most of my films, uh, uh, and when they deal with uh, realistic subject matters, which so many of them have, I do try to treat very honestly in mm -hmm. terms of the story and the characters and the backgrounds. But I do think it's, I think it's 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 part of the art of films, or maybe all art, to give a a sense of something beyond and there's some 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 way a sense of 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 hope. It might be a warning, but a feeling that beyond there is uh, uh, a better future, a better life, a better world somehow or another. Right. I'm a great believer in in the need for people to, around this world to get together, uh, uh, to communicate. I feel that, and having worked abroad on, on so many films in so many parts of the world, and worked with people in those areas, I feel that peoples have so much more in common than they have in discommon, that I think maybe underneath there is a striving towards making, through my films, this message that mm -hmm. uh, there is a chance for us to overcome and get together and and well, make a world. Well, that's that's one of the great things about about your films, because with one or two exceptions, there is this this great feeling of hope, this um, optimistic spirit, and that's what so many filmmakers today they're so totally, so totally devoid of optimism in any way. Yeah, yeah, and everything is a put down somehow. Right. And, uh, 
And uh, look, a lot of life is a put down, but I think we have to hope that it won't always be that same way. <laughs> That's right. What, uh, what is your manner, generally speaking, of preparing for a film? How much do you plan? Oh, very, very completely. I'm as far, I suppose, uh, from an improviser uh, as uh, one could possibly get. I, I, I don't go to prepare to the extent of Hitchcock, who well, I gather <laughs> literally almost draw, draws every frame of his films, but I, I believe in that process. I must have a script, a script well worked out. And I, if possible, and, and generally I, I have a storyboard, I work with a sketch artist to do a, a sketch continuity of the way the film will look, the way the compositions will be, the way the texture will be. I'm very, I get very deep in, uh, in uh, all kinds of, of research. For instance, the sand pebbles, which was China in the 1920s, just months spent on gathering all the possible research that we could, uh, trying to get everything as authentic and as real and as properly representative as possible casting them with the same eye towards the properness and fitness of everything. And uh, it, by and large, the whole picture uh, and the approach to it planned out very well, but always leaving myself room once I get on the set to uh, give my actors their head some and let them bring what they can bring into the scenes themselves as the characters uh, that I, as a director from outside, could never possibly put into it. Before we talk about some of your other films, I did want to ask you about your beginnings in the motion picture industry. Actually, you, before you entered films, you started to be a journalist. Isn't yes, that right? yes, that was what I was studying in college back mm -hmm. in the 30s in the day of the Big Depression. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm a depression dropout. I <laughs> had a year of college and no means of going back, so I had to go to work and fortunately ended up in films. That's brought me here today. Well, how did that exactly come about? I'd had an older brother who had gone from Indiana. That's my origins. I was born there at school there. I had my older brother Dave had gone to the coast about five years before this, 1928. And there was a family conclave, and they decided that uh, the thing to do was for me to go to the coast. My brother had come home for a summer vacation, go back and go to work someplace. So he was working at RKO Studios in his fields of accounting. He was working in the accounting department, but he was got me interviews with several department heads, and fortunately for me, the department that needed an eager young man of my age at that time was the editing department at RKO. And thereby hangs the tale. I think you said at one time when you were first starting out in films, you called yourself an every kind of assistant. Yeah. You did everything. <laughs> I did everything. <laughs> I was a film porter. I checked prints. I was an apprentice sound effects cutter. I was a sound effects editor. I was a music editor. And then I moved from that into assistant editing on films. and. And I was uh, I, had a, I have a great break uh, there and got to got to break in as an assistant with an old timer who was a marvelous editor who would let me even the first picture I worked with him let me first cut a little sequence myself which was rare in those days and uh, in two or three pictures I was doing all the first cutting. Wasn't there there one something that you started by you impressed the RKO people with some with salvaging some South Sea oh, footage? Oh yes, or something. that was back when I was still in the in the uh, sound effects editing. It was a, a chap who was another earlier mentor of mine, T. K. Wood. Uh, they had had a, a film that Ernest Schrodzak had shot a lot of, uh, attempting as a film, South Sea Island stuff, that mm. it just never got together and the stuff was lying around in the vaults. And Woody got an idea of making a short subject out of this. So every time we had a hiatus in the sound effects department, he and I would got, pull this film out and work on it. And eventually we got about a 10 minute short out of it, which the company liked and took over and gave us each a $500 bonus, as I recall. And mm. That was my first screen credit, as a matter of fact. I guess you would say then that your um your work as an editor has proven really invaluable to you oh, as a director. Yes, yes. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great field to come from for directing, you know. Yeah. It's not the only one, as we know, because many stage directors and writers and others have become very successful directors. But as an editor, you do get in contact with all the areas of filmmaking, all the departments, all the aspects that go into it right from the beginning, uh, through all the making, through the finishing up, through the sound, the music, the lab work, even and all. Mm -hmm. And it's a marvelous, marvelous training ground for a, a director. What was the first film in which you received full credit as an editor? Uh, the first film as a full editor was, I believe, uh, Bachelor Mother. The Ginger Rogers. Yeah, Ginger yeah. Rogers. I had had co-credit several films before that with Billy Hamilton, this editor I worked with. My first uh, solo credit was Bachelor Mother, Gar Kane had directed. Yeah. Well, several years later came Citizen Kane, which was, of course, a, a milestone for everyone associated with it. As the man who so brilliantly edited it. What is your opinion of the film, and has it changed at all over the years? 
No, I think it, uh, it has changed, yes, yes. I think it's a far finer picture yeah. now than I realized it was at the time, although we all knew that we had a certainly outstanding film, we're working on one. But uh, none of us could, could predict that it would last through the years as the kind of classic it's become. And uh, I actually hadn't seen Kane for a number of years until about three or four years ago when I was involved in a class about Kane at UCLA. So I said to the professor who was holding this class, well, I better take a look at it again. I haven't seen it for a while. And I was, I was like a new audience with it. I was so terribly impressed hmm. by the work in that film and by the, everything it generated and by the script and the acting. And I, I, well, no one would be in a better position than you uh, to know, having worked with Orson Welles as much as you did, was he as inventive as some say he, he was? Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. No question. Not that other people didn't contribute tre mm -hmm. tremendously, as they do at any, any director's work. Uh, Greg Tolman is you know, a tremendous cameraman that did Kane, and Perry Ferguson, who was the uh, art director and designer, contributed much. But listen, getting those scenes together and making them work and making the whole life and energy and style and feeling of that picture come together was, was Orson. I know there's been this great controversy about who did the script, Pauline you know, Pauline yeah. Kael's article. And, I've been asked many times about what I thought of that, and I've had to say very frankly, well, it was almost as, uh, as revealing to me as to anybody just reading it for the first time, because I came on Kane after it had started shooting, so I wasn't around for any of the development of the script or doing the script. Uh, Herman Mankiewicz was not around for any of the shooting, so I had no reason to believe other than this was what the credit should be. Mm -hmm. But I can only say that having been there during the shooting, uh, Arson's stamp as a director and filmmaker is so heavy and so strong in that film that it has to be his film without any question at all. Yeah. Well, certainly one of the most dazzling examples of the great skill with which Kane was edited is the famous scene in which Susan Kane is introduced and the camera pulls, it's, it's a rainy ah. night, and the camera pulls up to the neon sign and appears to, without a break, go we'll, through we'll the, right through, the yes. skylight. Yes. But actually, there was a break there. There was a break. It was done in a movement, and then there was a miniature piece in there, and then down on in through the right. skylight of an actual set. It was right. about, as I recall, about three pieces of film. Right. But it was, uh, and, and, and I'm sure that uh, a chap like Ferguson and, and undoubtedly Greg Tolan, the cameraman, had much to contribute in the realization of that, you know. But I'm sure that Orson's visualization of what he would like to see was very strongly there. Mm -hmm. They undoubtedly helped him in the means of how it could be attained technically in film terms. You directed, for the, the first time, I believe, portions of the, the next Wells film, Magnificent Ambersons. You know, we, there were big problems with that film. Yeah. Orson was not around to go to the previews with us. He was in South America doing a film. This was during the war for the government. And uh, we had big problems. We had to edit and lose a lot of footage because it just didn't work with an audience. And in order to make it hold together, there had to be some bridge scenes filmed. And uh, I did shoot about three or four of those, not all of them. The mm -hmm. ending I didn't shoot, the new ending. But I shot about three or four of the others. Mm -hmm. I, you, you mentioned one time that he tried to give you instructions on editing over the phone <laughs> or something. <laughs> I got phone calls from him from uh, Rio. And then I got, I, first thing I got, because we had sent a print of the, of, the, of the film. As a matter of fact, I had been scheduled to go. And then the last minute, there was an embargo put on any civilians flying out of the country. So we had to send the print to him. And I had some place in my files for years a 35-page wire from him, a cable of what to do, what was wrong, changes to make. Uh, very unsatisfactory way to work with uh, the director. Yeah. Well, was it directly as a result of Ambersons that you were given a chance to direct fully? Not immediately, no. I had, uh, I did a couple of three other films after that, I believe. The uh, Bombardier was one of them. I think there was one other one. But I had asked the studio over a period of years to give me a chance. And uh, it was actually in 1943 when I was editing a small horror picture for Val Luton called The Curse of the Cat People that I got my chance to, unfortunately, in a way, because they took a director off and put somebody else on, and I was the somebody else. Mm -hmm. I got my chance to direct to finish the film. Your first A film uh, was, mm -hmm. I suppose, Blood on the Moon. Blood on the Moon, yes, right. Yeah. Th was this at RKO? This was still at RKO. Yeah. I was at RKO from 43 when I started directing until 49. Uh, this was about 1948 I made it. And it was a property that RKO had had on the shelf around. And a friend of mine, who was an editor also and somewhat producer, got the idea of redoing the script and trying to make a successful Western out of it. And mm -hmm. He and I worked together with the writer on the script and got together. I did want to ask you about the setup, which is justly considered certainly the, the finest fight film of all. 
I have never seen Robert Ryan before or since as great as he was in this. What do you suppose it was about this which enabled him to be so good? I think Bob had such an appreciation and understanding of feeling for that character. Bob himself had been a, a fighter in college. He was the intercollegiate heavyweight champion when he went to Dartmouth. So he knew fighting, and he knew the fight game, and he loved the character, and he loved the whole look and exposure that the film gave to the fight game. And so he was totally dedicated to the whole project. As a matter of fact, we delayed the film for a matter of months because he was doing another picture in order to wait and get him to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was this uh, feeling and understanding literally for boxing itself, having done it, that gave him particular empathy and simpatico with the part. Well, those films, uh, fight films, can so often tend to be static or to one who isn't passionately interested in fights, uh, rather tiresome. But this wasn't. Everything about it worked so well. You know, the, the origin of that, you know, was a poem. Really? The setup is a long blank verse poem by a fellow named Joseph Moncure March. You would never, never think of a, of, a, of a fight, a story of a fighter such as that being done in terms of poetry, but it was a marvelous piece of work. I suppose if everyone knew the origins of some films, they would be astounded. <laughs> <It> would be, <laughs> yes. So many of your films I, I want to talk about in our limited amount of time left, and The Day the Earth Stood Still is one of them. Do you remember this film fondly? Oh, yes, very much. It's one of my favorites, you know, the favorite half dozen films I've done in my career. Patricia Neal, and I had the pleasure of talking to last week. Oh, did you? That recently? Yes. Good. She, she's uh, fine now, I guess. It's yes, she's doing well. She, good. She's of the opinion, and I think I must concur, that it's the finest science fiction film of all. Mm. Uh, did you intend for the film's message, if I can call it message, to be as pronounced as it was? Well, very much so. Very much so. Uh, this was, uh, as you know, this film came out in 50-51, and uh, right at the time of... Uh, you know, a big reaction to the atomic bomb and the possibilities that it foretold for the future. And uh, we went very much to make a point of warning to the world about the danger of the bomb. Well, we, we are almost out of time. I know the, the entire world is going to see The Sound of Music once again. Would you tell us just a little bit about your new film, which is Two People? Oh, yes. It's a new, new film called Two People. I did last year in Morocco and Paris, it was starring Peter Fonda. And a new girl I hear, think you're going to hear much about in coming years. It's her first feature, name of Lindsay Wagner, mm -hmm. and also co-stars Estelle Parsons. It's a very simple, very small, very intimate story, a love story in a sense, very touching, very timely. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think audiences will find a lot of identification with it. Well, any Robert Wise film is an event. I really want to thank you for talking with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Thanks again. I want to thank all of you for joining me tonight. Be with me again next time. Good night.